Okay, so this is the second um, Science of Logic pre-course um, lecture. Um, and the sort of the overall purpose of doing these pre-course lectures is to give sort of a, a, a good general background um, and a shared sort of conceptual framework, let's say, for entering the actual Science of Logic course to give it some context, um, to give it some depth, which should hopefully um, enrich our experience um, and also hopefully um, lift up our own interpretive power um, to bring our own ideas um, and to bring our own sort of frames of reference to uh, this, what is ultimately a historical text. So like I say, the Science of Logic course, uh, this is all in preparation for that, which starts January 16th, 2023. Um, you can find more information about the course at philosophyportal.online slash science of logic. Um, and there are four tiers um, available. So uh, more information on the website. Um, this is the second uh, pre-course, as I say, and we're gonna be focusing on the phenomenology of spirit which will be familiar to um, those of you who took the philosophy portal course, Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, some of this information may be new to those um, who are coming to Hegel for the first time. Um, and uh, it's an extraordinarily important text in, extra in the history of philosophy. Um, what we're gonna be doing here is looking at this text in the context of uh, what will be a precursor to the science of logic, we could say, and we're going to go into this a little bit more, but, you know, you could say this is Hegel's phenomenological term, um, setting up the logic, um, and the relationship between phenomenology and logic will be crucial, not only to understand Hegel's intervention into the history of philosophy, um, but will also be crucial to understand um, how he, as a, as a philosopher, was differentiating himself from his fellow, uh, from his philosophical contemporaries, um, uh, far outside of his field, and also those very close to him, namely his uh, fellow German idealists. I think it's always important to consider these works in the context of the life history of the people who were writing them. Um, so when we're looking at, for example, the formative moments, as we did in the first uh, pre-course video, we're, we're looking at Hegel in his 30s, basically. Um, when Science of Logic is published, we're looking at Hegel in his 40s. I think this is nice to think about when, and also to reflect on our own sort of philosophical maturation, you know, to sort of contextualize where they were in their life, so to speak. When the Phenomenology of Spirit is published, we're no longer in Hegel's formative years. We're not yet at his sort of peak, let's say, his full maturation, but we're certainly a far ways along the way, around the time of 38 years old, Hegel's publishing the Phenomenology of Spirit. And again, as many of you will know, um, the effect that this book had, which is basically a science of experience, the effect that this book had on um, the history of our planet, you know, that I was going to say philosophy, but really the history of our planet is, um, you know, uh, just, uh, it can't be understated, especially when you situate it in the context of um, the Marxist and the existentialist um, and even the analytic movements that came out as a consequence of the phenomenology of spirit. Um, and the large scale political socioeconomic impacts that those sort of subsequent movements um, set up, which is basically the modern world in, in many ways and, and, and the history of the 19th and the 20th century. So starting out here with the phenomenology of spirit 1807, what is it? Well, it's the concept of the experience that consciousness makes of itself. Now, What's crucial here is we already have two crucial distinctions, the concept and experience. Um, Hegel's always interested ultimately in the concept. Um, and that's why a lot of post-Hegelian philosophy will come out focused on existentialism as a sort of reaction to Hegel. Um, what Hegel was interested in was basically giving a 
conceptual overview of how consciousness comes to make sense of itself in a historical process. So the way in which you know, the, the metaphor that Hegel uses in the, in the preface of the phenomenology is basically an embryo to an adult. Um, the logic of the adult is already in the embryo and comes to be through a, through, through a pro, comes to uh, greater and greater consciousness of what it is in and for itself. Now, ultimately for Hegel, that's not just uh, the biological metaphor of a, an adult biological human being, but he's ultimately interested in this differentiation of knowing um, the level of philosophy, the level of philosophical thinking. Um, and he'll posit that as a type of logical historical necessity. So one way to think about that is that all paths, no matter what path you're walking for Hegel, lead to, uh, uh, contingently lead to uh, a historical necessity that is absolute knowing. Um, I've got an image there of um, a tightrope walker, um, reference there to, to Nietzsche's Zarathustra a little bit. Um, but also these opposites of the head and the heart, and, and that will come up throughout uh, the phenomenology of spirit, the relationship between these two metaphorical dimensions of our consciousness, and, and, and it's, it's really mediating these opposites um, where one will uh, reach the path of absolute knowing that that perhaps comes, comes out most explicitly in the chapters on spirit and the chapters on religion. So the science of experience is an introduction to speculative philosophy. That is, and this is sort of Hegel's sneaky point of, of introducing this book before the science of logic, which is pure speculative philosophy. He wants people to understand what he will frequently call ordinary consciousness before people read his science of logic, meaning there's a certain type of mind, there's a certain type of cognitive disposition, let's say, which is necessary to really understand and really you know, put in the arduous labor, because that's what it is, it's an arduous labor, to um, go into speculative philosophy to the depths that Hegel has uh, dedicated his time to speculative philosophy. So basically, Hegel's not looking for a mass readership in some sense. Um, well, it could be a mass readership, but what he's really looking for is a readership of deep philosophers. He's, 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 he, that's, what he, that's who he wants to read his work. In other words, you know, there are many types of consciousness, many forms of consciousness, um, many forms of consciousness who will, you know, either say Hegel's impenetrable, Hegel's impossible to understand, Hegel's nonsense. For Hegel, he's not so much interested in most people's opinions um, of him. And, and of course, this is this is situates him in a long history of philosophy, where we have the distinction between doxa and truth, you know, opinion and truth. He's looking for what he would call absolute knowers. He's looking for people who are going to read from the standpoint, a logical standpoint of what he would call true thought. Again, distinct from say the opinions of experience um, and, and ultimately here speculation free from ordinary consciousness or, or what we could call the rabble, uh, what Hegel will call the rabble. And of course, in the sort of history of what I've taught through philosophy portal, um, what Nietzsche will also call uh, the rabble. And so there's, there's a way in which there's a very deep cognitive differentiation, emergence of a singularity of thought, um, which is almost a predisposition. It, it's almost a, a requirement, <laughs> sort of like, you know, it, it, and I, reading Hegel, oftentimes I get the experience almost of, the same level of attention, awareness, and so forth, um, discipline is needed to read Hegel as, for example, reading, you know, very advanced technical physics or something like that. There's, there's, there's a certain a priori barrier to sort of entry in terms of understanding the depth of what you're, what you're reading. Okay, so moving on here, uh, the phenomenology of spirit precedes the logic, that is the science of logic. And it differentiates, and it differentiates him from the other idealists. 
So what specifically allows for this differentiation? It's for Hegel, an outgrowing of the dependence on intuition. Um, as I taught in the Phenomenology of Spirit course, if Hegel has an enemy, it is the dependence on immediate intuition. Now he's not against the immediate intuition as such. What he's against is the undialectical reliance on immediate intuition. And this is where Hegel will set up two of his most important concepts in the science of logic here, maybe getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. The concepts of immediacy and mediation, where medi mediation would of course be on the dimension of the concept, um, that, that intuition basically always has to be conceptually mediated. And it's not so much the starting point of what the intuition holds as absolute, as the result of its mediation or the cognizing of absolute thought. And this, this separates Hegel from the other idealists. Um, and, uh, and we'll get into sort of um, the consequences uh, because the consequences of this distinction are huge. Uh, not only with the other idealists, um, as we'll see their results uh, still depend on the intuition, whereas Hegel's do not. Um, this difference also separates, it creates a lot of trouble for Hegel in, in post-Hegelian philosophy in general. I mean, the, the, the first person who's coming to mind here is someone like uh, Henry Bergson, who will you know, not only be anti-Kantian, but also anti-Hegelian. And, 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 place, and actually state explicitly that the absolute can only be cognized from the point of view of intuition. So, so this distinction really goes to the heart of a big disagreement and, 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 a, and a big difference. And, and so, you know, it's just interesting to become aware of, of how important this difference is in the history of philosophy. So here Fichte, another German idealist, and Hegel are aligned at this point uh, in the release of the Phenomenology of Spirit. And what, uh, you know, against Schelling and Kant, the other two major German idealists. And what they introduce is two series of representations. So basically all representations are not equal for Fichte and Hegel. There's basically the representations of experience, specifically engaged experience, the um, the representations that you were taken through in the phenomenology of spirit, namely those series of transformations, consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, spirit, and religion. And then there are the representations on the level of truth. And these are the result of keyword mediation on the right-hand side there. They're not immediate functions of the intuition. They're a consequence of reflective mediation. Uh, now, of course, Hegel is not opposed to engaged experience, but, but one must, well, one must precisely engage experience to find out the truth of, of, of that experience as a result, as a result of reflective mediation. And so this series on the one hand, an experiential series, on the other hand, a truthful series, really start to open up a new dimension of idealism. So the second series, and this is crucial and, and also where ultimately Fichte and Hegel will undergo their own differentiation with each other, is on the level of the true motivation. So both Hegel and Fichte believe that this second series of representations allows the philosopher to know true motivation, whereas people within the domain, people who are dependent on immediacy of intuition, people who are identifying too strongly with the engaged experience of their subjectivity, that is their sort of identity as an ordinary consciousness, do not really understand their true motivation. You know, for me, thinking now on the history of post-Hegelian sort of thought is that it's, it's hard not to make a connection here between Hegel and psychoanalysis, because in some sense, psychoanalysis makes the same claim that there's unconscious motivation. And so most people, let's say ordinary consciousness, do not know the truth of their motivations. They do not know the truth of their unconscious systems, which is 
throwing them around, so to speak. Now, for Hegel and Fichte at this point, they're saying that concepts, not only of ordinary consciousness, but the concepts of Kant and the concepts of Schelling are still too subjective. And here's really, you know, subjective a priori categories, you know, for Kant and, and Hegel's, we're going to find out, you know, he's not really going to put up with this sort of subjectivist conceptualization. <clears throat> What I think is really important and, and, and is really powerful, you know, to keep in mind, and, and, and it's really hard to do emotionally, it's really hard to do intuitively, you know, but at the same time, Hegel's requiring this of us as philosophers is recognizing that the representations of the large majority of people are not reflections of truth in the philosophical sense, they're reflections of a subject who is searching for self-identity. And this is so important um, to understand. Um, it, it's, it can also be very difficult to embody and, 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 draw, and, 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 and exist in sort of social dramatizations where people are searching for their self-identity in their representations. I'm, I'm talking about intimate relationships. I'm talking about professional development. Um, I'm talking about ideological battles, you know, conceptual battles. You know, this is this is all raging, and, and you know, even what you could say is the culture wars. Uh, this is what's going on. People searching for self identity. People not really understanding their true motivations. People, you know, separated from the truth, so to speak. So Hegel negates previous attempts to escape processual understandings of conceptualization. So here, again, I'll bring up Kant. We have the a priori categories. Hegel says they're too subjectivist. Hegel says that they are an attempt to escape uh, conceptual conceptualization as process. Um, and Kant's categories here for Hegel would be a function of the intuition where Kant is not able to cognize how these concepts were derived or was able to put them to any meaningful use in history. You know, um, Kant had great ambitions. Kant's intuition may have pointed in the right direction, but ultimately for Hegel, uh, his intuition uh, left him stuck uh, in some sense with a static, fixed, subjectivist, set of concepts. And then also, again, Schelling's intuitive absolute, where Schelling, now Schelling will ultimately say here, because of his reliance on the intuition of the absolute, Schelling will say that art is actually higher of a function than philosophy. Um, now, that, that's another important distinction to keep in mind. That's another important distinction to be aware of here. Um, as structuring the history of philosophical thought is, of course, Hegel is the philosopher of philosophers in some sense. So for Hegel, art is not superior to philosophy. Religion is not superior to philosophy. Um, and, and that goes into his demand of thinking, of conceptualization. You know, when Deleuze, for example, great anti-Hegelian, post-Hegelian thinker, says that philosophy is about the derivation and the creation of new concepts. You know, Deleuze here is, is, is very Hegelian in some sense, you know, and I think that will come up a lot if I ever do teach Deleuze. But that being said, I think this is important to, to know, to be aware of. So the truth of the concept for Hegel is resolved in experience. This is crucial is that Hegel, and this is crucial for thinking about what the reaction to Hegel was in, a, in, in existentialism, in socio-historical economical pragmatism, is that Hegel's not saying that there's just the concept like Plato and, and that the experience doesn't matter. He's saying that the truth of the concept is resolved in experience. So there's a weird paradox here, again, involving not just the immediacy of the concept, but its mediation in history. 
And specifically, it's related to our interests. It's related to our needs. It's related to satisfying our desires. It's related to um, uh, figuring out our self-identity ultimately and, and coming to some relationship to a true sense of self-consciousness. And for Hegel, as a result of understanding this mediation and trying to formulate this conceptual mediation, he could do away with Kant's absolute categories, and he could do away also with cosmic imagery of, of the other or of God, and that's on the Schellingian side, let's say. So, you know, what does this mean, practically speaking, when we think about contemporary identities? Well, if you think about the way in which many professional identities rely on a set of fixed categories, um, like in the previous lecture, I showed images of the particles, the, the, the sort of categorical determination of, of the field of subatomic particles. Or, for example, you know, any set of scientific categories where people's identities become fixed. You know, Hegel's saying you don't need those categories as absolute to understand yourself or to understand your identity. So a lot, basically a lot of modern professional identities rely on fixed categories to give themselves a sense of home, to give themselves a sense of identity. On the other hand, there is a large scale return of, and I'm noticing this more and more, is there is a large scale return of, of fundamentalist religion. And fundamentalist religion has always reemerged, reappeared throughout history, um, throughout the modern world, of course. Wanting some image of God, wanting some image of union with God, often these images do function on the level of intuition. So again, Hegel is kind of against this movement. He's, he's saying that, that in some sense, Hegel's saying these are childish. <laughs> these are a function of a cognition which doesn't understand itself and so relies on these others. Ultimately here, Hegel differentiates from Fichte in the end status of the I. So where Fichte and Hegel disagree, this is where they split, is in relationship to the nature of the I or the nature of the self. So for Fichte, he had, and we'll go into this in much more detail in the future pre-course, Fichte's I is a pure I with abstract freedom. That is, Fichte's I has no limitations. Fichte's I is a pure absolute cognition of itself. Um, whereas Hegel's I is a historical entity. Hegel's I is in some sense, merely a perspectival shift which changes nothing. <laughs> You're still just a historical entity, as individual spirit, a si ultimately a singularity. After the mediation of the particular and the universal, you're like a singularity. And you're still engaged in spiritual. You're, you are spiritualizing nature. Your work is spiritualizing nature. And not only that, what's crucial here is the different relationship which Fichte and Hegel set up in relationship to limitation um, and the power of limitation. Of course, this is gonna function on the logic of the negation of negation. And basically here where Fichte sees limitation as brutal natural necessity. I'm very sympathetic. I understand where Fichte is coming from. I often feel the exact same way. What Hegel's saying is, is that if you were unlimited, if your eye was a pure eye of abstract freedom, you wouldn't exist. So he's saying that Fichte's system sets up a, a situation where if you achieved freedom, you wouldn't exist. If you achieved the freedom, you wouldn't even be a historical self-consciousness. So it's kind of cheating. It's not really, it, you're not really understanding what we are. And, and so, so there's, there, is a, there is a way in which here, to be a Hegelian in some ways means that you do return in some sense to the rabble as just an ordinary consciousness, but there's a perspectival shift. And that perspectival shift is that difference in the series of truthful representations. 
And it allows you in some sense to be uh, uh, an, a, an agent of truth and reflections or a reflection of truth. You don't even really even need to say anything specifically. It's just sort of the way you are. It's, and, and, and I suppose if, 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 you know, really done the work in a Hegelian sense, it will just show, it'll just show, it just would be, it'll be what you are. So Feek's I is a negativity. So this goes into what I've already sort of pointed towards. <clears throat> and Hegel's I is a negation of negation. So basically Feek des desires a release from all limitations. And we, we all understand that desire. We all understand that, that, that motive. I, a, lot of, a lot of what I've done in my actual science of experience, so to speak, you know, the actual engaged motion and and all the time I, I have fantasies of of no limitations whether it's fantasies of no limitations you know it could be could be sexually it could be economically it could be you know uh, creatively it could be in many many different dimensions we all have those fantasies um but hegel's here is saying it, it is a perspectival shift on limitation that allows you to see the, media, the, 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 the liberation and mediation, and that actually, if you had the freedom you thought you wanted, you would, you'd be dead. It's, it's a death drive. So, so this also brings up themes from psychoanalysis as it relates to death drive, as it relates to the eros and thanatos, all very important here. So the historical subject must consummate satisfaction in its own work. That's ultimately where we come to. Spirit's own self-transformations is, is its satisfaction. And, and, and Hegel's always calling you back to yourself. You know, in the science of experience, in the process of development, in the coming to be what you are, you're always going to get just thrown by, it, by the other, ultimately. And, and he's always pulling you back to yourself. He's always pulling you back to your own process of spiritual self-mediation. And subject spiritualizes nature. In some sense, there's no, 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 no extra thing. There's no <clears throat> supernatural extra substance, so to speak. Um, but there is conceptual mediation. And that's on the dimension of, of spirit. So here coming almost to the end, we have phenomenology of spirit is subjects increasingly explicit awareness of itself. Um, in some sense, Hegel thought this was necessary, and I think coming from Hegel always has his eyes, I think, on Plato and Aristotle, and I think that comes across in the phenomenology of spirit, and I think that also comes across in the science of logic. I think what Hegel's adding to Plato and Aristotle, so to speak, if adding is the right word, is an increasing level of self-awareness as a consequence of the historical process and that philosophy needs to make that higher level of self-awareness explicit and ultimately come to a place not of a external eternal idea existing independently of us historically but rather spirit's own self-idea that this is spirit's own self-idea and that ideas of an external eternal idea is another way in which spirit becomes externalized falls into the other falls into external cognition and does not yet understand the truth of itself does not yet understand the truth of its own idea so philosophy is it ultimately its own introduction. That and that that means basically, you know, it may take a certain bar to really understand Hegel, so to speak, in, in full detail. However, he is ultimately saying that if you really, and this is why Hegel seems to have a great love. I think it's limited, but he definitely has a great love of skepticism. And I think Hegel would say, if you live a skeptical life, if you live a life of constant questioning and you treat yourself as the ultimate question, that philosophy is its own introduction. That if you really engage experience of life and are not just interested in immediately identifying with your intuition, but really coming to understand the, the truth of the results of your cognition, then that is, that is philosophy. You know, that is, <laughs> that is philosophy. Now, 
what's crucial here, and this is as it relates to the two series of representations, Haeckel thought reason is self-justifying. So I've had this experience. It can be quite frustrating, but of course, for someone at, on the level of absolute knowing it, I don't think it would be frustrating. It could be, I suppose, but not necessarily, is that people will always use their reason to self-justify, even if they're wrong objectively. Um, again, that can be very frustrating, but be, you know, for Hegel, because reason is self-justifying, the only thing you can do ultimately is focus on your own sort of rational mediation and let the cunning of reason, so to speak, do the rest. That is all of the failures, all of the breakups, all of the falling apart of your social environment. You know, sometimes there are real antinomies. Sometimes there are real conflicts and contradictions which simply have their solution in dissolution or reach their maturity in dissolution, so to speak. And, you know, also in terms of philosophy as its own intro, specifically after removing a self-obscuring element, that self-obscuring element is ultimately your own starting point, your own intuitive immediation, your intuitive immediacy. That is, you were born, you were helpless, you were fragile, you were totally dependent on the other. And so you have to dissipate that subjective contingency in order to find out your own notional, notional necessity. Now, that doesn't mean that contingency as such is eliminated, um, as we'll find out in the science of logic, necessity and contingency are an absolute unity, but there's a way in which the contingency of your birth um, is no longer obscuring your understanding of truth. All right, so this is the final point I wanted to, I think this is the final point here, is that the phenomenology of spirit is an account of philosophies ultimately here. Phen phenomenology of spirit is an account of philosophy's own coming to be. And you can make a point that this coming to be is biased towards an account of Western history. Certainly if we look at the chapter on religion, where this is probably the most obvious, is that this account sees from a Western point of view. It sees from a perhaps a Christian point of view. I think that also comes out in Hegel's writings. And so we have to be aware of that. We have to ask ourselves questions about that. We also have to be aware of simplistic oppositions to that, which I do think appear in the postmodern literature as it relates to Hegel being too Western-centric, too Eurocentric, um, not enough taking into consideration the view of otherness, the view of the Orient, Asia, Africa, and so forth. We do have to ask ourselves, what does the phenomenology of spirit look like in a global context? Um, after the coming to be, after the maturation of America, of Russia, of um, increasingly in the 21st century, the BRIC, Brazil, India, China, um, and so forth, and, and, and who knows what the future of Africa might be and its relationship to the rest of the world. We have to ask ourselves these big global questions and their, their consequence for uh, how we conceptualize the West. Um, but these are very open philosophical questions. I, I don't know how we should tackle them yet. So the paradox, there is a paradox also in Hegel's logic, which um, I think also structures a lot of the big questions that I see self-identified Hegelians wrestling with. I know Zizek brings this up quite, quite a bit, um, is the paradox of Hegel's logic being both a priori and historical. So whereas Hegel says that Kant's logic is a priori and not historical, Hegel has a weird opposition here between a priori. Again, think about the embryo and the adult. It's both a priori and historical. It only comes to be as history, but it in some sense contains its result in the beginning. And it comes to be what it always already is. And this is, this, this is the paradox. And it ultimately it comes down to what is the historicity of Hegel's system? And, and again, this is a theme which I think you can find repeating in post-Hegelian philosophy. 
So in the next session, in two weeks time, we'll be focusing more on Kant's critique. We'll be focusing more on Fichte's freedom. I gave you an introduction to those dimensions of, of the, the story, the background, but we'll be getting a full overview there uh, in the next session. And uh, that was Phenomenology of Spirit from, from 1807, just gives you a sort of historical overview there of the importance of the book and, and what that book's trying to say and why it's important for the science of logic ultimately, which again, starts on January 16th. And you can find more information about that at a philosophyportal.online slash the science of logic. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Okay, so uh, any questions, any any ideas? Start, just raise your, raise your hand and uh, we'll get into it. I mean, I think it's always, it's always, oh, uh, you have a question there, Peter? Just, you, there's a hand raising function, but you can unmute yourself and, and ask. Well, just um, tying in what you're sitting near the end there with something earlier on about, you know, the problem of absolute categories, mm -hmm. categories of, of things, of concepts. Um, you know, could you not also imagine that Hegel's got a set of concepts, the negation of the negation, his, his ideas about the self, about history. And he's a kind of a whole set of things here that, you know, are kind of like always take, that's his toolbox. Is that not, does that not suffer from the same possible criticism of a system of absolute categories? or absolute categorization yeah. it, it's it's a good it's a, it's a good question um it's so the thing is is that in some sense hegel's concepts function in a way that reminds me a little bit of how um psychoanalytic concepts are supposed to function namely that they're they're not supposed to function as to, and so, and now we get into, here we get into the paradox of the thinker's intentions and the follower's results. It's, it's a really important <laughs> distinction and, and it's really, it's really hard to walk that line. I think that, that oftentimes when, whenever I, for example, think about Marx or Foucault or and a lot, a lot of other people I could name, Freud, you could name Freud too. Oftentimes it's not so much their writing that's problematic, so much as it is as the results of the actualization of their concepts in history through other subjects. So this is a big thing that we have to think about. Um, absolutely. I hope that, I hope that answered your question because certainly if you relate to certain concepts in Hegel as absolute categories, this would be um, falling into a trap that I think Hegel himself would negate. And the best example I could think about this, if I could relate to this personally, is for me, I teach about Hegel online, but when I'm in a relate, like when I'm in a sort of, let's say, an important personal intimate situation in my actual life outside of teaching, I find the concept of the negation of the, the, ne the concept of the negation of the negation, for example, not as something that like, uh, I wanna like, I want my intimate partner to understand or something like that. It's more something that, helps me to get through conflict, not, not talking about that concept, but helps me move through conflict in life in general, if that makes sense. I think another thing that might be interesting to say here and please, anyone, just raise your hand if you want to ask something. Uh, we'll get to you next, uh, Jason. But another thing that might be interesting to say here is, 
is not confusing your learning about philosophy as that process by which you're trying to find your own self-identity. And of course we are using philosophy. We are reading, and me too, right? Me too. Using philosophy as a way to, to better understand my self-identity, but then not get, getting confused with those two series of representations, the representations of, of experience and the representation of truth. And, and so like ultimately, like for example, for me, I'm using philosophy ultimately to develop my own concepts. Like for example, all the stuff I write is not about Hegel. It's I've got my own books, which are just Cadell's books, which are just my concepts. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not teaching about them yet, but you know, I'm not just, you know, I think that's a trap. So Jason. Hi, yeah. Um, whoops. Yes, uh, perhaps related to that. Um is uh, you ended earlier uh, by saying that Hegel is criticized as, you know, ending in a paradox or, you know, the whole business about um, being a priori, but also contingent as your example with uh, the birth. Uh, but if Hegel demands uh, a readership that, he, that, that, that self relates, that, that has a moment of self reflection, but, but he also, ends with this kind of paradoxical position. What does that say about the nature of our self-relation? Can we only relate to ourselves through paradoxes? Is this the, 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 is this the true way, so to speak? Well, how, you know, I don't have the, the final answers on, I'm also in my process of coming to understand Hegel, like so for example, with the science of logic being kind of written in his 40s, he does have a series of lectures in his 50s, which I'm gonna come to eventually. So I don't know where Hegel himself ends, you know, his, let's say his final word or something like that. But in terms of how I understand Hegel now, he does positivize contradiction. And so in some sense, when we think, when, like if you take, for example, this paradox of logic being both a priori and historical, I don't know if you were in a cafe with Hegel, whether he would say this is a bad thing. He might just say that's the thing in itself, that the thing in itself is this paradox between it being both a priori and historical, and that he would maybe say that other philosophers under only understood the a priori dimension of it because they were dependent on the immediacy of intuition and they hadn't yet understood the historical development of the idea. Certainly there's a way in which when I read the science of logic in, in detail, when he's, it's, it's worth paying attention to the way he relates to previous philosophers because a lot of what he's saying about Spinoza or Leibniz is this principle of differentiation, this principle of individuation is something that they had yet to cognize fully. And, and he's trying to bring that out um, in, 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 and so, and you might say in post-Hegelian philosophy, they just take that even further. It's like, you know, someone like Kierkegaard or someone like Deleuze, they're just like, we're gonna take that even further. You know, like, I, I don't, we, who knows? Max? Yes, yeah, so I've just um, two questions here. Uh, one, how does the phenomenology relate to the science of logic? And then how does the phenomenology help Hegel think pure being? There's a quote here on page 47 in the D. Giovanni um, where he addresses this. It's in the chat. A beginning is logical in that it is to be made in the element of a free self-contained thought and pure knowledge. It is thereby mediated for pure knowledge is the ultimate and absolute truth of consciousness. We said in the introduction that the phenomenology of spirit is the science of consciousness, its exposition, that consciousness has the concept of science, that is, pure knowledge for its result. To this extent, logic has for its presupposition the science of spirit in its appearance, a science which contains the necessity and therefore demonstrates the truth of the standpoint, which is pure knowledge and of its mediation. And then he goes on. Uh, later in, uh, in 47, he says, what we have before us is only simple immediacy. Simple immediacy is itself an expression of reflection. It refers to the distinction from what is mediated 
the true expression of this simple immediacy is therefore pure being. Mm -hmm. So could you, you ask me, thanks for reading that. Could you ask me the question again, how phenomenology relates to the logic and how, how phenomenology how, helps Hegel understand pure being? Yes, exactly. How does, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so the key distinction between phenomenology and logic, and, and remember, I've, I've said, I've always said this while teaching the phenomenology is that it's not so clear to me that the phenomenology of spirit is what Hegel thinks. It, it's more, again, he's trying to, he's almost offering a, a very weird ladder <laughs> to ordinary consciousness. You know, it, it's almost like the preface to the science of logic almost. It's like, if you can work it, if you can work it, if you can work through this science of experience, ordinary consciousness, and I can take you through all these distortions that you're, that are clouding your, 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 your capacity to see truth or pure thought, then you'll be able to understand what I'm talking about as, as logic. And in terms of, so he's making a distinction between ordinary conscious experience and conceptual logic. And if you think about his critique of science, it's not really that we should just get rid of, he's not, he's very friendly to science in some sense, but he's saying that science needs to help ordinary consciousness reach the standpoint where it can use pure logic without turning itself inside out in some sense. And, and that's what the whole big problem with scientific materialism is, is that scientific materialism doesn't help consciousness get to the standpoint where it could actually use science. And so like we have all these paradoxes in the modern world where you have modern scientists building atomic bombs for use in wars, or you have modern scientists building very advanced technology and who the hell knows what we're gonna use this for or if we should even build it in the first place or what the consequences of all this is for historical consciousness. So basically he's saying you have this really important weapon, conceptual weapon, and your children, and you're not willing to put in the work to get to the standpoint from which we might be able to use this weapon wisely. You know, so it's like said in that way, it's like really important, I think, to do this work, to, to, to put in the arduous labor. It is arduous. You know, I read Hegel and I'm like, there are some times I'm reading Hegel and I'm like, I'm really enjoying myself right now. Then there are some times I'm reading Hegel and I'm like, why the hell am I doing this? Why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> you know, so, so, but that's the whole barrier. You've got to, it's, I always say, it's like, it's like telling a kid, you've got to take Buckley's medicine. You know, Buckley's medicine doesn't taste very nice, but it's going to help, it's going to help you out. So, and then in terms of your second question with the phenomenology as it relates to pure being is how does Hegel conceive of pure being? And here he, he's so, he's so philosophically sharp with connecting himself back to the greats is that he goes back to Parmenides with the one, his being is one, is only one, but what does he say? Being is also pure nothing. Pure being is also pure nothing. And what does Parmenides say? Pure being is and nothing is not absolutely. So how does the phenomenology help Hegel understand the logic is that it helps him confront negativity and negativity, emotional, ne it's, it's, Hegel does what, what the pleasure principle, Hegel does what your mind spontaneously does not want to do, which is go for pleasure instead of truth. And Hegel saying, this is not pleasurable, but this is the truth. We got to try, we're going for the truth, you know, and, and, and then you can go back to the world and, 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 and you're going to be with all these rabble, but at least you'll be able to reflect the truth in some meaningful sense. And, and I do think our society needs that. I do think we need a society where being is also understood as nothing because what do we need? We need a society that has a mature relationship to death, that has a society that's, that, that is stopped having all these adults who are just trying to immortalize themselves constantly. Our whole society is organized like this. It's a big problem. I wouldn't be here if that wasn't the problem. That's my life. It's been my life. Philosophy of maturity he's developing. Adult consciousness needs maturation. Adults are not maturing. They're not the people, the, the, broadly speaking, I don't want to 
make this like i don't think this is best framed as like a generational war or something but in some sense the adults of the west post world war ii have not experienced enough negativity and they're immature as a result and that's why we need to read hegel <laughs> and we need to change it <laughs> james Yeah, excellent, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, Cadell. Uh, so, um, I've been reading through the science of logic, reading in the group. Uh, the gang has been reading together. Uh, it's something that I think you know, the Zizek brings up too is this idea of um, determinant negation. And I think uh, you know, I mean, I I want to connect what you were just saying you know, to this concept, but, you know, it, 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 it seems, it seems like, it seems pretty important. Um, so I guess I just, I would love to hear you, you know, talk about it just a little bit, if you, if you wouldn't mind. So the best way to bring, I'm going to bring this, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to bring this out still trying to figure out how to teach how best to teach the science of logic but I'm, I'm going to do my best to bring out sort of the most important concepts and the most important relations to the history of philosophy as i can and the best way i think to relate to the determinate negation is is and to pay attention to this when you're reading the science of logic is to pay attention to the way hegel relates to spinoza because in some sense, the way Hegel relates to Spinoza is Spinoza is using determinate negation as his absolute concept. And it's basically that all positive finite determinations find their truth in the abyss. And what Hegel is saying is that misses the dimension of self-relating self negativity. And that comes up again and again, is that finite determinations find their truth in the abyss, and they also find their truth in the genesis from the abyss. And that's the self, the self-relating dimension to it. So it's it's the the, the passing away and the coming to be. It, to, to give like the short Wikipedia answer to determinate negation, it's that determinate negation is a is a conceptual movement which prevents the dialectic from becoming a purely negative dialectic. It's the positive dimension of the dialectic to, to give a, a very, again, you could read this anywhere online. But you know what that means ultimately in relationship to the history of philosophy and Hegel's system as it relates to previous dialectical systems is that Hegel says that Kant comes to a purely negative dialectic. Spinoza doesn't even set up a dialectic. And he even says that all of Plato's dialectic is external cognition. He even says that about the Parmenides. It's just external cognition in the end of the day. And that's why Plato's idea is just the eternal idea that exists independent of human beings. So determinate negation involves the self-relating part and it, 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 the it involves the way in which the subject determines finite being in some sense, or has, plays a role in determining finite being. Uh, Quinn? I, I could give yeah. it, I, sorry, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Quinn. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'll, it, it always click. I also want to give tips, like, because I'm also giving these tips to myself while I'm trying to create the course is like Hegel's writing in a hyper, hyper abstract way. And he has the aim of, you can, like, you can tell when he's writing, he, he's almost trying to write something that's eternal. <laughs> and, 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 and as a consequence of that, it's and he and he wants an audience like he he's, he basically states explicitly he wants an audience that's similar to the audience that Plato had in his school. He wants a similar audience, <laughs> you know. And and so when thinking about reading Hegel and making sense of it, it helps me anyway to constantly relate it back to personal examples in my life. So, for example, with determinant negation, is that if I was just operating in a purely negative dialectic, I would find myself, for example, intellectually in my history as an academic, uh, 
I would just find myself in the abyss of contemporary academia and I would just deconstruct it. So I would just deconstruct. So anyone who's like deconstructing academia, that's a purely negative dialectic. A determinant negation would create from that abyss. And so in some sense, philosophy, to give a very concrete example, I would consider philosophy portal as my own determinant negation. So to bring it to a very concrete concept, uh, Quinn. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate you sharing the the moment of just like like why why am I reading Hegel? Why am I doing yeah, it? all this time? <laughs> that it, feel, it feels like you are kind of doing a certain violence to yourself and a certain you violence are. to the purity of intuitive experience, you know. Yes. Um, and just on on this point, I, I was reading a bit about the connection between Hegel and Hermeticism and Hegel and mysticism and this particular book compares the phenomenology to a kind of process of initiation and purification that you find in the hermetic tradition and this kind of process of the transformation of identity to a kind of mystical state, a stage of absolute knowing, whatever we want to language it, right? Um, and Hegel even at one point compares the language of speculative with mysticism. So he is pointing towards the state, but it seems like, like you were saying, the big differentiator is that Hegel does not rest with the experience, but wants to, do you think it's fair to say, understand the logic of the mystical state or yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. Do you think, and in that act, is there a kind, is there a kind of violence even in that act? <laughs> you know, because, yeah. Look, yeah. I mean, the more I understand myself, the more I feel like there is a primordial violence, like Freud says, like Gerard says, there is a type of primordial violence. There is a desire to kill even on 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 the deepest level and and we could get into i think it's really interesting to study like i've mentioned in previous podcasts i think it's interesting to study serial killers and stuff like that the the way their cognition works how it functions you know it's in some sense you're just seeing naked truth naked it's very you know it's very naked it's very raw um it's very disturbing it's very uncomfortable and also in the sexual act and pornography and all that's online you can see the sort of this naked unmediated truth and it's 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 this brutal natural necessity which Fichte's thinks to, he can't stand it you know and and fair enough and I can't in many ways obviously I can't stand it either um so but to your question about the mysticism and the experience and the, the logic and, the, and, and conceptuality. So I have a very concrete example, which is very alive for me right now, which I think will help. So and I think Dimitri and I are going to have a conversation about this on his channel. So I think I can just say this is like so Dimitri is doing psychedelics ayahuasca at the Santo Daime recently, and, and I've done that 12 times. So I have some experience of what he what he went through and. So when the first time I did psychedelics, I mean, you experience God. You, ex you experience the absolute. My first experience on ayahuasca was like, holy shit, you know, <laughs> eternity, you know, or something like that. Just this immediate collision with eternity. And having, I had all these visions in my head of, you know, a, a perfect society or like some utopian society running around me in my vision. Now, what's the difference between a typical mystic and Hegel? Yeah. Is that a typical mystic might stay in the immediate identification with those images, whereas Hegel would say those require conceptual mediation. So if you're having experiences of God and you have experiences of this transcendental society where like in my vision, it was like just like the whole world was like in some like harmonious utopian, you know, ex ecstasy. That requires conceptual mediation. I don't think I'm actually going to see that in my lifetime, but, but it's very hard to conceptually mediate a, a deep society. 
And that's ultimately what's at stake in Hegel is, and now, so now the truth of that difference, where do we see that immediately? We see it in Marx. We see it immediately in Marx. We see the logic of Hegel's philosophy leading to the logic of communism, and we see the logic of communism being unable to mediate its own phantasmatic imaginary and it leading to catastrophe. And we have the consequences of that today with the emergence of global capitalism as the universal field. So we have to think through these things. And, and, and so mysticism is an important part. We have to include mysticism as an important part, but we also have to understand that we're we're in history and things get very complex and many intentional communities and many mystical startup communities run into problems of violence and sex and money and all sorts of shit. We have to be aware of it. Uh, Peter? Yeah. Quinn, did you want to continue that for a second? Well, I, yeah, maybe, maybe just, just want one more quick, uh, quick thing because the, there is... I guess this po this point of kind of staying with the contradiction, the tension, the antagonism, even post the mystical state, because there's a way in which that state gives rise to, I think, these kind of uh, phantasmagoric <laughs> structures of thought and, and, and this the sense in which there is a perfection to being and then and then you have to, like, go through the tragedy of losing that again after um the mystical state and then in that state that's when i've noticed a strong propensity to posit the <laughs> the utopian vision because it's so it's like you you've had some mystical experience of it and so you yeah but there is still this imminent impossibility and antagonism and something barring you from that you know and it's yeah. hard to stay with that thing and then in terms of the you know the when i try <laughs> When I try and explain sort of this notion of the science of mysticism or the logic of mysticism, um, I do sense that there is a, some attachment to the mythical mode of representing that, you know, and some sense that people feel that by trying to apply a logic to it, that you're eroding the mystery. There's a like I sense this like there there's something that's gonna be lost by by yeah by going through that process um, yeah and I'm yeah. sorry sorry for for cutting you off there yeah um, but, um, yeah so this is very common and this this comes up I ex when I was like fully in a scientific mode always the relationship that would come up between sort of the scientific cognition and let's say the non-scientific cognition or it could be the religious, could be the mystical, could just be common sense, intuitive, immediate cognition is that you're taking away the mystery. And I think that this is a science that his, this is a science which has not yet included the revolutions of the quantum and not yet included the revolutions of the incompleteness theorem, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, the mathematics of modern mathematics, modern physics. Like you've got to update to modern physics and modern mathematics because modern physics and modern mathematics know that you can't completely get a deterministic system and erratic. In fact, the more you, so, and this, the paradox in modern mathematics and modern physics also comes up in Hegel, which is that the more you know, the more mystery opens up. And like, so, and Zizek is so, like Zizek is so good at that too with the paradox of absolute knowing. It's it's almost like absolute knowing involves a closure where the journey starts. And so really, you know, wrapping your head around that's difficult, but I think it's important. And I think that gets away all this fear of science is going to take away the mystery. It's the opposite. And now, well, so now here's another, now here's another interesting dialectical flip. Because science isn't going to take away the mystery, it's going to open up more mystery. Well, what might you confront? You might confront fear, right? That's also scary. Mystery is not just good. <laughs> like mystery is also terrifying potentially. <laughs> like it's, holy shit. Like my entire identity is gonna, might, might become different. Like, like there's like, you could say like, for example, science doesn't really understand surprise very well. And surprise, we, we think about surprise, oftentimes you could think of like, for example, if you surprise your best friend with a present, 
It's like, that's a really good surprise. Like, oh yes, a surprise. You can also have a surprise that's very terrifying. <laughs> so so we, have to, we have to think about this too. Okay, Peter. And then Max, and then we'll, we'll have the last question. Well, um, a couple of things. Yes, science doesn't take away the mystery, as you say. Every uh, every question answered leads to two more questions, ideally. And yeah. So <laughs> mystery. Uh, but perhaps what it does take away, and I think Hegel mentions this in the introduction or the preface to the phenomenology, uh, that it might take away people's edification, because when we finally reach a level of understanding of how the world is, or we, we've got a shoebox big enough to fit the world in, we might have to cram it in there a little bit, uh, then we can be we can take solace in that, whether it's you know edification or enjoyment or the avoidance of of uh, the despair of of the abyss, as it were. Um, so I just want to make a comment about that. Um, the question I had actually goes back to what Quinn and you were talking about. Um, the question of the exploration of the truth of experience, immediate experience. What is, is there a truth there in immediate experience versus any kind of ab abstraction about it? You know, reasoning, reflective thought, something which is there by definition, not in the experience, you know, because any kind of reflection about an experience has to be subsequent to it. As soon as you're, you know, as soon as that re that reflective machinery, the mach the meaning machinery kicks in, in a way you're sort of taken out of the immediacy of that experience, and so I'm talking about that in relation to um, psychedelic experience, having been, you know, involved in a psychedelic community, ayahuasca community, and uh, that kind of thing, and asking myself those questions. Um, you said something about, you know, having had the experience and coming into contact with God or with the absolute or well, you know, you could go on. Uh, many people have. And, you know, there's a laundry list of possibilities of what is going on in psychedelic experience. And so, you know, I won't add my own thoughts about that uh, to it. But, you know, it's a question of to what degree, you know, the experience is, is real, if we could say that, you know, there's a subject having an experience, maybe that language could be called into question, but it's probably beyond the scope here. Um, but what that experience is of, is precisely what could be bracketed and um, and set aside. So how does this sort of idea that there might be a truth in the immediacy of experience, every day, even everyday experience, kind of align with or relate to Hegel's suggestion that absolute knowing or truth is something that is born of that sort of reflective understanding of things by using the reason? Yeah, so fantastic. I love thinking about these things. Again, I don't have final answers to them, but like these are like the types of space. These are the I, 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 in some sense, I do this work because these are the types of questions. These are the types of discursive spaces that I'd like to be a part of. <laughs> so, one really important thing in terms of truth of immediate experience is that you'll see immediately in the science of logic that when Hegel's setting up his system, um, immediacy, there's always a dialectic between immediacy and mediation. Immediacy is always mediated. And, you know, basically what that means is, is that the desire, so what I read here is that there is, there is a strong desire, and I've seen this in my, with my academic colleagues in the past, I've seen this in, um, Sir, I've also done, you know, work in spiritual communities, I've seen the same tendency come up cognitively, so I'm saying there's something cognitively going on independent of our intellectual backgrounds is that there's a deep desire for an immediacy that has no mediation, just immediacy. I just want immediate. I don't want the mediation, <laughs> you know? So, and that's because for Hegel, mediation involves conceptual work. So what Hegel's saying is, is that you could have a very, and what, what do the psychedelics open up in us? Psychedelics, in some sense, they shut down your concept, they break apart your conceptual frameworks in many senses, and they bring you to a more profound and a more intense immediacy than maybe you've ever experienced before. Now, Hegel would say that immediacy has emerged in the context of a history, meaning that, like, 
if you experience ayahuasca at 30 versus you experience ayahuasca at 10, say, that will be different. I mean, you'll have different experiences. In some sense, when I was a kid, I had like weird psychedelic trips and dreams and stuff like that. And but that's another topic. But the but just saying that, like, even when I think, like, for example, every time I did psychedelics, I did a trip report after the psychedelics, I would write down sort of my experience. And what I would recognize is that the in itself of the psychedelic experience was always being filtered through, in some sense, my concepts. Like, like if I was writing about my psychedelic, I could, I could only make sense of it in terms of my, my concepts. But in terms of the experience in itself, it's in some sense, you know, um, impossible. <laughs> but, it, you know, an impossible real, you know? But anyway, this is going too far. But the, it goes to what, what is real and stuff like that. But the, 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 the crucial point I think Hegel's trying to make is that even if we do, and I think Hegel was involved with different sort of, let's say, mystical communities, whatever, and Plato was involved in mystical communities. Like, I think you, you can't write what Plato wrote without being involved in mystical communities in some degree, understanding the, the idea, the truth of the idea itself. Like, it's like, yeah, it's like a psychedelic trip. But, <laughs> but like, the, the crucial thing Hegel's asking of us is to bring the truth of this immediacy into mediation. And this is what I've said to other psychonauts, is that what would impress me about psychedelic communities, and I've worked with psychedelic communities. When the coronavirus hit, I was working with psychedelic communities and, they, and there's a lot of problems that we experienced in psychedelic communities. And a lot of those problems involve the mediation of actual historical reality and actual subjective bodies and actual desires and interests and money and power and all this type of stuff. Shamans, shamans have rape charges and all sorts of weird shit. Like, so there, this is what Hegel would bring our attention to. He'd bring it to the attention to the mediation. And instead of getting attached to the pretty pictures and the great experience, and that's enough to say about that. So we'll go, to, uh, did you want to respond to that, Peter? Or then we'll go to Matt. Just one quick follow up on that is uh, this research uh, by, by a woman researcher, scientific researcher, I can't remember her name, but what she has done is shown how much that meaning, the meaning we ascribe to things is right there in our experiential moment. So, for example, a simple example would be like looking at the color red or even to the degree to which we d d distinguish between horizontals and verticals. I mean, OK, perhaps there's no great meaning in that. But, you know, if you're standing on the edge of a cliff, there's a great meaning in knowing the difference. So meaning is right there in our experiential reality. And that is presumably an historical, whether it's in the genes or in our conditioning or in our, you know, in our reflective thought throughout our lives. You know, and then again, in, even in psychedelic experience, you know, I think what people bring to that. Um, the, there is the, the point is simply that there appears to be meaning right there in the immediacy of experience in a pre-reflective way or you might say post some reflections or conditioning in earlier moments that then are determining what is being experienced and so i just wanted to throw that out there as something I'm, I'm very interested in exploring yeah and so when we're thinking about when we're thinking about this and again moving through the science of logic, we can set this up in the context of what is often referred to in these broad intellectual communities as the meaning crisis. And in terms of the meaning crisis, what is that saying is like, yes, there is this meaning there in immediate experience, but then what about the mediation of that meaning? So we need to think about the immediacy of meaning and we need to think about the mediation of meaning. We have to try to dialectic. I think, we, I think what Hegel would say is we have to dialecticize meaning both on the level of immediacy, because if you're not connected to the immediacy of meaning, you're not gonna be able to mediate it. But then the mediation is also important. And, and so the mediation is to me pointing towards questions that are inherent to um, social historical life, community life. And, and, and so anyway, I said enough about that. Max? Um, any other advice? We're going to be reading the Doctrine of Being, book one. That's where we're starting. What, what should we keep an eye out for that in that book? So 
So there's a few things about the doctrine of being book that will be helpful. One, the doctrine of being book is by, for, by far the um, largest of the books. It's the reason why it's the largest is because it's the only book that Hegel had time to revise. He wanted to revise book two and three. They're noticeably shorter. And the reason why they're noticeably shorter is because if Hegel had his way, we would be reading a much larger book, but unfortunately life had other, <laughs> he died. So, so book one is much larger book. Yeah, thank God, <laughs> I've had that thought. But so, you know, book one is much larger, more complex. Pay attention, start to get used to the difference between the sections, he always structures them triadically, and the remarks. Because the remarks are different in tone than his sections. The sections are very formal. Again, they're like eternal abstractions that he just wants. He's basically like, he wants these to be read 5,000 years from now, you know, like. And then the remarks. The remarks will help you understand what he's saying in the technical sections. And the remarks will help you get more understanding of his sort of historical conflicts with other philosophers. He'll often mention Spinoza. He'll often mention Leibniz. Pay attention when he mentions other people. Pay attention to the works and the concepts he's pointing to. And never be afraid to Wikipedia these concepts to get a certain background on, 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 on what they are. They'll help you understand the history of these concepts. Because um, Hegel is very much someone who is trying to, again, he's trying to write a tweet that will take thousands of years to understand. And he's very precise with everything he's trying to, to, to say. So that's one thing. The other thing is get used to the paradox of being and nothing. Get used to that paradox. Be inside that paradox as a becoming, because as he states explicitly, that principle is the principle upon which the whole of the rest of the analysis depends. And if that principle is wrong, then everything else falls apart. So as you move through the other sections, you'll, in order to help orient yourself, because it might get conceptually dense and tricky, remember that all of this is resting on the paradox of being and nothing. And so there's always this weird relationship between something and negativity, which is always keeping the ball moving. It's always keeping the becoming becoming, right? So keep all these things in mind. Um, that should help. And um, whatever your personal sort of tool is, like for me, I never just, like for me, I never just read. I read and I write, you know? Maybe I think in symbols or, or words, maybe you wanna draw, maybe you wanna image something, whatever it is that helps you comprehend deeper. What my crucial thing is, is to be an active reader. I'm never just a passive reader. I'm always an active reader. I always give the example of, I read in the same way that a hungry lion chases a gazelle. Otherwise I don't read. Because otherwise I'm wasting my time. Otherwise, you know, because you have that phenomenon where you read a paragraph and, and you just realize you didn't understand anything. I try to avoid that by being an active reader. So anyway, that's a tip. All right. So thanks for all these questions. This was a great Q&A and uh, hope, hopefully the presentation gave some helpful background on phenomenology of spirit. In two weeks, we'll be doing a session on Kant and Fichte. And then there's, well, there's three more sessions before the class starts. So you're welcome to all of them. And I'll do updates and notifications about all of them. And have a great evening. Awesome. Thanks, Goodell. Peace out. Thank you.